Olympia Brown lived during exciting and formative years of this country. She was a pioneer in the best sense of the word, from her birth in a frontier cabin, her passion for more and better education, especially for women, to her career as the first woman in our country to achieve ministerial standing recognized by a denomination. Her reputation rests also on her untiring work for the cause of women's suffrage. Her visit today coincides with an important event in the continuing protest. It is December 1918. The Great War has been over for about a month. Oh, I am so glad to see a good crowd of you here this evening. It's exactly what I was hoping for because everybody has said nobody cares. Nobody's interested in working for women's rights. And now it seems as though there are some people who want to hear the story, want to hear what we have to say. I'll tell you, there's a great deal still to tell. <clears throat> you know, our president, Wilson, is over in France right now, and that man, and I'll use that term, that man, even if he is our president, he's bragging about what a wonderful democracy this is, a wonderful place for liberty, wonderful place when over half our citizens can't vote. I tell you, we're showing the people out there on the, on the park, outside of this building, I just came from there, we have a fire in one of the urns by the Lafayette statue, and we are burning President Wilson's speeches. Yes, that's what we should be doing. They handed me his speech that he gave in Paris, was going to give today, I guess he's given it, and said, you may put it into the flames, Olympia. You represent part of what we're talking about. And I stepped up. I needed, <clears throat> I needed a little help to get up on the stone base, but I got up there. I'm, I'm 83, but the point is I shoved it into the flames, and I said, Mr. Wilson, I protest you're going to another country when there's so much work still to do in this country. I have been fighting for liberty for 70 years, 70 years, and it's still not finished. Now, you may not believe that it's been 70 years, but I tell you, it happened when I was 13 years old. You see, my parents were, I can only call them real pioneers. They came from old Vermont. My mother was Lethia, my father was Asa. Their names were Brown, they were not related, but Brown was the family, a lot, a lot of Browns in that part of Vermont. But the point is, they were free thinkers. Universalist ministers had come through. They had no church, but they were circuit riding ministers. And these parents of mine thought for themselves, not just in religion, but in politics too. Anyway, it was, it was a practical reason that caused them to move out to Michigan. They bought a farm that had been partly developed and then the owner had moved on. And soon after their marriage, they put their possessions into an ox cart and walked all the way out to Prairie Ronde, Michigan, where they had bought this farm. My father cut some wood for the winter in their woodlot, put in a crop of winter wheat. My mother hung up uh, muslin sheets to give a little privacy in the cabin. And there I was born on January 5th, 1835. Two years later, my sister Oella was born there in that same cabin. And two years later, my sister Marcia, well, it wasn't Marcia. By the time she was born, my mother had prevailed on my father to build a house with clapboards on the outside. And they had three bedrooms upstairs and downstairs. They had a parlor and a sitting room and a kitchen, a big kitchen. And that's where we children grew up. And we didn't know that our lives were somewhat different from other children of that time. You see, my parents subscribed to the New York Weekly Tribune. They took turns reading the paper to each other. And then they asked we children 
what we thought about it. By that time, they had my brother Arthur, who was, who was the youngest in the family, three children. And in that time, when children were to be seen and not heard, we were invited to talk. The other thing my father did was build another cabin. And he put me on a horse, and we rode side by side on the horses and went around to all the neighbors. Now that Michigan had become a state, we had to provide education for the children. And he told all the neighbors in quite an area, you have to board the teacher for two weeks, and you have to provide a dollar fifty. And they got enough of them, so the teacher got a dollar fifty a week during the school year and had a place to live and eat. But that wasn't enough. Eventually, when I got to be 12 years old, I needed more education. And so we went into Schoolcraft, Michigan. And that's where I learned the things that I'm talking about now. It was a good school. There were four teachers, but they were not treating us fairly. The boys got to make speeches. The girls had to be silent, or they could read their compositions. And when I thought this seemed shall we say, unfair. I got my cousin Addison to speak up and say, why couldn't the girls speak and make speeches like the boys? And all of the teachers, all four of them, stood up and said, if Addison persists in this ridiculous idea, we will leave. I felt so sorry because I'm the one that had put him up to it. But the point is, they said, oh, well, I guess he was just having a little fun. And they all sat down, and we went on. And they used the same rules in which the girls kept their mouths shut and the boys got to talk. But the point is, I learned. It's a struggle. We've got the beginnings of a battle right here. Well, my years in schoolcraft were good. I got a very fine education. It was equivalent to what I guess nowadays the young people would call a high school education. And the teachers changed from year to year. But finally, I said, I need more education. I talked to my mother and father about it, and my mother said, yes, they do need more of an education. And my father said, the girls don't need any more education. They're going to get married. And we said, Father, <clears throat> do you see any young men knocking on the door and asking for our hand in marriage? And father had to admit that it didn't look as if we were going to get married. And so we started looking for a place to get more schooling, and we found it in uh, Mount Holyoke, Massachusetts. And there, we had a chance to get almost a college education, even though colleges would not accept we, we women, we girls. We heard it was a fine school founded by Mary Lyons several years before. And so, with one of the other girls from Schoolcraft uh, and her father as a chaperone, we went off to uh, Albany, said goodbye to him when he went on to New York, and took the stagecoach through the hills of western Massachusetts. Oh, it was a beautiful countryside. And the school, when we saw it, was very impressive. But oh my, the rules, oh, they were dreadful. Young ladies may not speak above a whisper in the hallway. Young ladies may not look out the window. Young ladies uh, must uh, stay silent during study periods. Young ladies must do this, must do that. One thing, though, that pleased my father when he heard about it, he was a little skeptical about this idea of more education. But when he realized that the girls needed some education to be able to make their own living, he agreed that it was OK. The girls, and these were all students of all ages, most of us were in our late teens and early 20s, and we learned that uh, we had to get up early in the morning and uh, wring out a couple of tubs of, of uh, bed uh, linens that had been put to soak the night before. A few weeks later, we had to do breakfast, then we had to do cleanup. Once a week, we all cleaned the school rooms. The teachers worked, too. It was a practical system. And we learned a good deal as well. We started a debating society. My sister Oella and I were pretty good at this sort of thing, so that we invited the teachers to come and hear us do a debate. And the teachers seemed impressed, but they left without saying a word, either praise or criticism. And at the end of the term, we were invited into the principal's office, and she said, the debating society must be disbanded. I was struck silent. That's very unusual for me. But Oella spoke up, and she said, why? It teaches us to think for ourselves. It teaches us to be independent. 
The principal said, that's just the problem. We don't want you to be any more independent. You don't need to think for yourselves. You have parents, you have, you'll have a husband to think. Well, there it came again. You get a husband and then everything's taken care of. We didn't care for it, but there was nothing to do but go back to our rooms and disband the debating society. But worse was to come. You see, Mary Lyon had been very concerned about the reputation that her students would have. And at that time, of course, you had to be very religious. And while most of them came from homes that went to church and had various kinds of, of uh, religious instruction, at school, they had a special event in the spring. It was like a revival, and they brought in preachers, most of them pretty conservative, at least Oella and I thought so, because we had had nothing but the kind of teaching that came from a from a, a saddlebag preacher, and of course, my mother and father who talked about their own universalist beliefs. But these preachers would come, and the teachers would do it too. They would, they would prey on our, on our emotions. The teacher would say, oh, Olympia, it would make me so happy if you would just con confess your sins and say how wicked you had been and ask for forgiveness. I didn't really care for that. They did it to Oella, too. They wanted them to say, we have been saved, and now we're better people. It didn't change us at all. It just made me feel very uncomfortable. I tried to get out of it. I never did confess anything, and I didn't think I had much that needed to be confessed. But when it was time to go home at the end of the school year, we knew we would not come back to Mary Lyons Academy. And so, Oella started teaching there in the schoolcraft area. In fact, she taught right back in the little, in the little uh, cabin that our father had built on our own property. And she was making quite a career of teaching, but I wanted more. And so um, my mother and I planned. Uh, we found a day when my father had had a very, very good day as far as selling some of the products. And we, we cooked his favorite supper, which is always a very wise thing to do. And then after the meal, I walked into the living room and I said, uh, Father, I, I think I should talk to you about some more education. And he said, well, Olympia, you've decided what you want to do. And I didn't say precisely what I wanted to do. I wasn't quite sure, but I did say, I said, Father, I, I need to go to a real college. And he said, well, I thought there weren't any admitting women. And I said, well, there are some, but they're religious schools, and I don't want to be preached at all the time. We had no churches in schoolcraft. Again, just itinerant preachers. But he said, well, I guess that makes sense. And I said, besides, if I get a better education, I can get a job in a city school, and I'll have enough money to live on, and you won't have to support me for the rest of my life. That got his attention, you know. <laughs> but the point was, the point was, I didn't know where I could go. But there were two that looked pretty good. One was Oberlin, and one was Antioch. Both of them were in Ohio. Now, I had learned that some of the women in Oberlin who thought they'd gotten a good education were so disappointed because at graduation time, they didn't have a chance to speak. They got a diploma, but they didn't speak at graduation. So I tried Antioch, and Antioch was the place to go. I was so enthusiastic about it that after less than a year there, my parents uh, decided that they were going to lease the farm in, in, uh, in school, there near Schoolcraft and buy a house in uh, Yellow Springs, and the rest of my family, the rest of the kids, the children, Oella and Marsha and, and uh, Arthur, who gradually were coming closer to that type, time of education, could all have a chance, and they went to that school as well. And our home there in Yellow Springs was the center for all kinds of lively liberal discussion. Well, that was an important step forward. And uh, one of the things that troubled me, they had wonderful speakers, a lot of them from the East Coast, but from all over the United States. And I said, they're all men. And so I went to one of the professors who arranged it, and I said, why don't we have women speakers? And he said, oh my dear, there's just no one comparable, nobody that would be suitable. What you really need to do is, is uh, just listen hard to these men who we bring in for you. 
And I said, no, I want to have a woman lecturer here at Antioch. And he said, well, my dear, if that's what you want, you'll have to take care of it yourself. And I said, all right, I will. <laughs> so I went around and I asked my fellow students for some money. And they said, uh, well, all right, yes, let's see what we can do. And we voted on who we might invite. And we finally found the right person in the, name, in the person of Antoinette Brown who was preaching in a congregational church in South Butler, New York. She had gone to Oberlin, she had gotten a good education, but she hadn't really been made into a real minister. The local congregation had ordained her, but she was a fine speaker and she came and it dawned on me. She's going to speak in the college hall on Saturday. Maybe she could preach in the chapel the next morning. The professor who had that day assigned said, no, I won't give up my Sunday for her. So I tried one of the local churches that had no minister, and I had to go and visit every single board member, but in the end they said, yes, we'll give her a chance. She had an overflow crowd in that church. But the important thing is that when she finished her sermon, her talk, I realized that this is what I had been looking for. And I said to myself, I want to be a minister. I want to be a liberal minister like Antoinette Brown. I didn't know anything about the problems of ordination. I just knew that that was what my career needed to be. And so I thanked her, of course, and I finished my schooling in Antioch. And we came home, and uh, uh, once again, my mother said, how are you going to, uh, to bring the matter up to your father, Olympia? And I said, well, uh, let's choose a good menu for tomorrow night and, <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. So after we had eaten, it was, it was a very good day. It was, it was in late June. And I said, uh, Father, I suppose you're wondering uh, what I want to do next. And he said, well, yes, you have a teaching job in mind. And I said, N no, no, Father, I, uh, I, I've been thinking about it and I've decided I want to be a parish minister. Poor man. <laughs> it's lucky he was sitting down because he looked absolutely astounded. And he said, but uh, Olympia, who, who, who would hire you? He didn't know much about Antoinette's record, but the point was he knew me, he knew I had ability, but he just couldn't see anybody wanting a woman for a minister. And so I let me look around and see what I can find. Bless that man, he said, well, if you can find a school that will accept you to train for the ministry, I'll pay your tuition. Quite a man. Anyway, I wrote to an awful lot of places and all of them said no. Well, actually, that, that's not true. A couple of very, very conservative fundamentalist schools said they would consider having me as a student. Um, the Unitarian School in Meadville, Pennsylvania said, an interesting idea, but I don't think we're quite ready for it yet. And so when I got a letter from a little school, St. Lawrence in, in Northern New York, in Canton, New York, I expected it to be the same thing. Sorry, Miss Brown, uh, it's an idea, but we're not ready for it yet. Instead, Dr. Fisher said, well, while I don't feel that women are called to the ministry, uh, St. Lawrence accepts men and women on an equal basis, and if you would like to come, we will accept you as our student. Please send this and this and this and this. I was ready to pack my suitcases right then, even though it was only the month of March. Anyway, I went, and finally in September, I went to Canton, I left my, my trunk behind at the station and I walked up the, the short distance and up the hill. The college was located on a hill. And when I say the college, there was one building. Um, I had gotten a letter in June from Dr. Fisher, Dr. Ebenezer Fisher, and he said, um, I personally don't feel women are called to the ministry, but I'll leave it between you and, quote, the great head of the church. So I collected, connected with the great head of the church, and we decided I should be a minister. <laughs> but, but when I got to the building where his office was located, I realized he hadn't heard back from me that I had, had debated his, his requirement. And so uh, I, I 
knocked on the door, and this very tall man came, and I said, Dr. Fisher? And he said, yes. And I said, Dr. Fisher, I'm, I'm Olympia Brown, and I've come to study for the ministry. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, uh, <clears throat> Miss Brown, I hadn't expected you. And I said, no, I suppose not. And he said, I thought my letter had discouraged you. Oh, no, Dr. Fisher, actually it encouraged me. I think that women are suited for the ministry, especially for working with parishioners, even if we don't pre perhaps pre preach as well as the men do. He recovered quickly. He opened the door wider. He introduced me to the other faculty members, all four of them, and they gave me a warm, warm welcome. Their wives were another matter. <laughs> they said, what does she think she's doing here on a campus with, with only a male student body? The male student body included nine young men. And I said, I want to learn to be a minister. And the women just sort of shrugged their shoulders and were very unfriendly, at least for the first four or five months. But the point is, the young men, some of them were fine. The professors were very, very helpful and very gave credit where credit was due. But there were two of the young men that, that uh, they crouched under my window on, when I rehearsed sermons and said, she doesn't really know how to perform as a minister should. Her voice is too high and wavery. I knew I had to do something to lower my voice, but the point was these young men were making me feel very uncomfortable. Uh, but I gradually, I got better acquainted. Uh, at Christmas time, I couldn't go home because it was such a great distance, and so I preached over in Ogdensburg, New York. I, uh, I've had a chance to preach in a couple of other towns, and as the year wore on, I realized that the Northern New York Universalist Convention was meeting in Malone that year, about 50, 50 miles north of Canton. And I knew Dr. Fisher wouldn't propose me for ordination, so I decided I would have to do something myself. And so I took the trip up there, and I asked to be ordained. And they said, we will consider your qualifications, and we will tell you in a short time. And I went outside to wait. I didn't know exactly what to do, but I decided that if I wasn't going to have a chance to do this, I would try in some other, other place to get some more education. But very soon they came back and they said, Miss Brown, your qualifications entitle you to ordination. Let's set the date. And that was it. I was going to be a universalist minister. I was ordained on June 29th, uh, 1863 in Canton. And I went out and had a chance to do some preaching that very summer. One of the professors knew of a vacant church in Vermont. And I would have stayed perhaps longer, but uh, my mother said, Olympia, I need your help. Your brother Arthur is sick with rheumatoid arthritis and, uh, excuse me, a different kind of, of uh, rheumatism infectious rheumatism, I'm sorry. But in any event, Arthur was too much for mother to take care of doing the home nursing. So I resigned and went and joined her in Ann Arbor where Arthur was in law school. And when he got a little bit better, I went to some lectures and one of them was by a man named Dio Lewis from Boston. And I went up afterward because he talked about women's uh, gymnastics, I guess is the term, but I said, I wonder if the voice and the throat can be trained to be stronger, like the rest of the body. And he said, certainly, uh, Miss Brown, come to my gymnasium in Boston when you have an opportunity. So as soon as my mother could spare me, I went to Boston, wonderful city, had a marvelous time there. And I went and took courses. And he said, we can teach you to strengthen your, your shoulder and neck muscles. We can teach you to breathe more deeply, to lower your voice, to project it. He was right. I still do those exercises even to this day, and my voice does carry. And the other thing I did while I was in Boston, I went to the headquarters of the Universalist Church, and I talked to the minister, Ebenezer Fisher, no, excuse me, Alonzo Minor. Alonzo Minor was the head there. And he said, well, yes, um, <clears throat> yeah, I've heard of you. <laughs> I, I've heard you've been ordained and, and finished the course at St. Lawrence, but I don't know. Um, 
Oh, I know, Weymouth Landing. Uh, very run down. They don't have enough money to keep the church going. Their minister was very much into spiritualism. Um, I don't think the church is in good condition. I know the organ doesn't work, but why don't you try Weymouth Landing? And I thought, well, I guess it's a place to try. And so I was there for five years. It was a wonderful church. And I have a tendency to make churches that are, are tottering on the brink of disaster become stronger and more confident. And then after that, I went to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and there I ran into some other problems because there was one or two, such, there were one or two men who didn't want a woman minister no matter what. And so they finally made the congregation so unhappy with my ministry, even though a lot of them were supportive of me, that I finally felt I, I had to leave. They didn't have any money to keep going. P.T. Varnum, the circus man, was a member of that congregation, and he gave large donations, but it just wasn't enough. The one good thing about that part, though, of my life was uh, one of the members of my Weymouth church, John Henry Willis, had moved after I moved to Bridgeport, and he brought a, a new business in Bridgeport, and he said about, well, I guess courting me is the word, and my mother was very upset. She said, oh, you can't get married. You'll, you'll ruin all my plans for you after we worked so hard to educate you. And I said, no, mother, he's supportive in all ways. And so I married John Henry Willis. And I kept my name, of course, Olympia Brown. But the point was, um, after a little over a year, we had our first child. And not too long after that, we, we had Henry Parker Willis, affectionately known as Parker. And then we had our daughter Gwendolyn. And so this was the family. And even if I didn't have a church, I got interested in my new special concern, and that was votes for women. And that's about where I came in, talking about votes for women. I went on to Racine, Wisconsin. I went on to different parts of the country to lecture and speak. But the point is, my husband and I had a fine marriage. And after he died, I tried to run the business myself. He had a publishing business in Racine, but it, wasn't, it was very difficult. We, we didn't have quite enough money. I eventually sold it and went into work all the time for women's rights. But I did indeed have a, a chance to do some preaching in some of the small towns around there. And I eventually went to live with my daughter, Gwendolyn, who taught at the Bryn Mawr School in... Uh, Baltimore, and I could go into Washington and listen in on some of, the, some of the hearings and speak up for women's rights and women's voting. But it was a situation in which it needed more, uh, what shall I say, more concentration. Uh, as I said when I first came in, there weren't enough women who were going to drop everything else and work for it. It was a situation in which the, the, the women were more interested in what kind of a gift they were going to give to the outgoing president. And then, of course, I'm sorry to say that we women who were working for the vote split among ourselves. Some felt it should be done by states, and others felt it needed to be done in Washington. And so we wasted a lot of time. We also made the mistake of not talking to working women in the factories and on the farms. We also didn't get on good terms with the press. And so we, we took a lot longer to achieve our goals, but I think we're close now. I'm very close because we have learned, I'll tell you what we've learned just recently, and this is from Mrs. Pankhurst in, in England. She sent over or some of the women who went and worked with her and said, you've got to stop being polite and ladylike. You've got to go out and demonstrate. You've got to use some kind of strong language. You've got to say, this is what we insist on. And now that the war is over, we have got to push hard. Actually, those women taught us a lot of good strategy. And it was necessary for us because we were too polite. Oh, strategy. Oh, my goodness. Oh, dear. I think I've given you too much time. Uh -huh. I have a meeting to plan our strategy for tomorrow. It is too late. I've got to go. I've had a wonderful time telling you about my adventures, but we've got to keep at it because we're right at the end. And if we don't, 
if we don't do the things that they had advised from England, those women weren't all that ladylike over there. Mrs. Pankhurst taught them to carry banners and to go to jail and to put on, on food strikes and not to be such sweet things as they had been before. So we're going to win the vote for women by not being ladylike. Thank you for listening. <laughs>